Ryan, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you. So my name is Ryan Melser from American Battery Technology Company. So this is an especially appropriate conference for us. So we have two different business units. We have developed an integrated system for the recycling of lithium ion batteries. We're currently building our first pre-commercial facility. And independently, we also own large amounts of land and mining leases throughout Nevada, where we are working to extract lithium and other battery metals. So having both the battery recycling group and the primary metal group really helps us contribute to addressing each of these global challenges separately. I mean, the topic today is how the secondary market can contribute to really meeting the near-term demand. And battery recycling can be much quicker to market. You know, large amounts of feed material already prepared to be going through these processes. It can contribute meaningful amounts in the near term, but ultimately it really is limited by the quantity of material coming back from end of life, from manufacturing defects, from other types of feed material. And by balancing the recycling system with the primary extraction, we get both the quick speed to market as well as the, the much larger throughput once our primary facilities are operational as well. Ryan, you have your advanced hydro process. Can you tell us how that's different from other recycling processes and, and how do you bring that to market? How do you convince OEMs to, to work with you to secure supply? Definitely, so for our technology, you know, much of my background and the team we've brought on recently is much more on the manufacturing side of battery cells. So we started off designing you know, some of the largest you know, battery factories in the world, you know, at the, the Tesla <coughs> Panasonic facility near Reno. That's where much of our team came from. And when you really work manufacturing battery cells, going from raw materials to refined powders, to slurries, to coated systems, to dry cells, to rolls, to modules, to packs, and you see each of those incremental stages, each one of those is really where you see these different types of defects come off, where you see different physics-based mechanisms of what actually causes each step in the manufacturing process to fail. And when we came to design a recycling system, we actually designed what we call a demanufacturing process. So using many of the tools that we developed on the cell manufacturing side, we're now essentially doing those in reverse and actually backing them out. It allows for a very automated and a very low residence time process to reverse that system. And then when we talk about hydrometallurgy, it's, it's still a very large umbrella, a large set of technologies that fall within that family. And just because a few different systems are based on how to metallurgy doesn't mean that they're at all similar. So by doing that reverse manufacturing process up front, we're able to remove a, a very large amount of the low value materials, of the support materials, the subcell structures, and even separate out the subcell components that are chemically bonded together. And when we do that, the type of you know, slurry and filter cake we get at the end is very targeted already has very large amounts of the would-be impurities removed, and that's allowed us to put together a rather simplified how to metallurgy train. So we've been able to remove entire impurity removal circuits that would have been needed otherwise, but because we're able to remove these components mechanically up front, it greatly simplifies that back end. And every time you have an impurity removal system, no matter how good it is, you always take a little bit of the product of value as well. So the fewer impurity removal systems there are, the higher the recovery ratio. And then as far as the cost of these types of recycling plants, they really do end up being dominated by the chemical consumables in the hydrometallurgy train. Large amounts of the, at the acids, the caustics, the organics, the oxidizers that are consumed in the back end. And by having this targeted process, it really lets us reduce all of those chemical loadings, which reduces the operating costs of the plant and increases the recovery ratios of the high-value products. Dawe, we talked about it yesterday. You know, it's interesting when you, when you talk about where is the stream of recycled material coming from, um, even a, we, we model a up-and-running, well-run cell plant with about an 8% reject rate. Um, some of the newer plants, when they shift from new technology to new technology, 111 to 532 to 622 to 811, they can have up to a 30% reject rate. A lot of the companies tell us, and I'm curious, Ryan, I'll start with you, they want to work with you because, number one, um, if the cell manufacturer works with you, helpfully, it's easier for you to recycle, but then, as you said, maybe you can help them understand why they're seeing the defect rates they're seeing. 
Definitely. I mean, people say defect rate. A lot of times they think it means, you know, a final cell or a final pack that goes through a quality check. But it's each one of those nodes. So those numbers you're quoting, if you look at it just on a, on a mass basis, it actually ends up being quite a bit higher as well. Different types of powders and slurries and scrap metals all become waste products. And a lot of those intermediate and maybe unconventional waste products are even harder for conventional companies to recycle. So those pile up on these sites and manufacturing facilities. They're not quite sure what to do with them. And again, by having a reverse manufacturing process, we don't simply mix all the materials together and put them in the front end. So when we have our, our module section dissecting down to the cell level, any defects we receive at the cell level, we feed into that intermediate feed stage where it's already in the partially deconstructed set. And then the same with the powders and slurries. We feed those towards the back end of our system where the recycling stream is already back down to powders and slurries. And you talk about switching chemistries. You know, part people may overlook is really the type of qualification that's needed whenever a large chemistry change is made. So they're not necessarily defects, but there are, are hundreds of millions of cells that are made just for testing, just for characterization, to go through that qualification process that are never sold to market. So all of those need to be processed as well. And then the ability to take each of the elements we pull out and not just sell them back to a market, not just to the industrial market through a, a downcycling process, but actually to take them and purify them all the way back to battery cathode grade is not a trivial process. And then working closely with both the cell manufacturers and the step before them, the cathode refiners, to actually send these materials back to them in the exact form they need to really make that a true closed loop economy and return that material right back into the system. Um, one of the better proposition in, in Asia. It is interesting, I mean, because it was thought pyro was the first way to recycle batteries, but the recoverabilities and the ESG footprint is, is just not acceptable, so it will be hydro. Um, Ryan, you won the BASF competition. Um, can you tell us about where you think hydro is going and what the, you know, what the future is? As you said, there's not one hydro process, there's many. How do you think this will progress and what's your approach to the best, hopefully, hydro solution? Right, yes, it was grand, great to win that competition. And when people think conventional hydrometallurgy, they usually think of solvent extraction. And that's a very mature process. There are new extractants being developed, but the technologies themselves are very mature. That's more of a, a low-risk approach. You know, there are many different types of selective extraction, selective ion exchange type systems that can be much more targeted. And it really is about developing that, that network of components that fit together as circuits. Like I mentioned, having to have these types of impurity removal systems upstream of product <coughs> removal systems adds cost upfront and capex, adds operating costs, and reduces your operational efficiency and your recovery ratios. So I think it really is that the entire strategy of how you actually do that. And you mentioned that the high value components people think of nickel cobalt, sometimes you're able to, to extract lithium. There are many other components in these trains. I mean, people think of things like the fluorine and the phosphorus species as contaminants, as impurities, but those elements are still needed to make new batteries. So you can remove them as an impurity in an inert or non-hazardous form. You can treat it as a waste, but there's much more value in actually extracting them as products and return them right back into the market, even though they may not be as high of unit cost as the nickel cobalt up front. So I think people who say, you know, we're gonna do a generic hydrometallurgy train or all hydro trains are similar, that's a bit, you know, shallow of a statement. It's really about designing this as an integrated network and having it work with that strategy to balance the operating costs with your recovery efficiencies and, and not just going for the high value components. And you, you mentioned lithium specifically. I mean, lithium is challenging to recover in a recycling system because it's designed to be the mobile ion within a battery. So it's literally in, in every component. So when you start disassembling and sorting, you can segregate different elements relatively easily, but lithium itself is really in, in all of those components. So it's not just be able to recover some of it, not just the aqueous lithium, not just what was dissolved in the non-aqueous solvent, what was embedded in the active anode and the cathode, and really getting to a process where you can recover not just the primary streams, but the side streams, the recovery streams, those are really how you get to the much higher recovery rates for all of these ions of value. It's what you target, what we're often in these early stages, you, <clears throat> you maybe you target cobalt or you target the nickel or you target lithium, but then 
there's other parts of the stream that you miss out, and trying to get everything uh, is going to be challenging. And even the, the mainstream, like I mentioned, there, there are many side streams that are developed <coughs> as you start taking these other products off. And going after those side streams and additional recovery is really how you get to those high recovery rates. Ryan, can you go after that? So recover separator, yes. So recover it as a separate stream that can be sold into the plastic recycling market itself. So again, I mentioned taking an element and turning it back around directly to make brand new batteries is very important for a closed loop economy. Right now, the separator goes through a much longer chain. So we can recover it. We sell to plastic recyclers, which then make more precursor for the plastic process, which eventually get back in. So it goes through some external processors, but, but overall, yes. Can you uh, tell us the, your philosophy on uh, open loop, closed loop, and how to close the loop? I mean, many people look at closing the loop. I always feel kind of in the, the carrot and stick approach. There are a lot of policies that are meant to punish companies who don't recycle batteries or individuals who don't, or try to force a minimum amount of recycle content into materials. For some industries, maybe you need to do that. But for this industry, I think the carrot works much better. The fact that there's so much value left in these end of life and defect materials, many recycling processes to date haven't been efficient enough to be able to operate at sufficient margin to recover those with real value. But as these new technologies come online, if you can operate a high margin facility and recover these materials, and especially in areas like the US and North America, where there's you know, almost zero production of these battery metals, you know, the, the lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, each of those four, less than 1% of global capacity is in the US. So having an end of life battery can essentially be the perfect mine to recover each of those elements in the exact ratio needed. And if you have processes that can really recover them back up to the battery cathode grade specifications and return them right back into the market in North America, that's how you close the loop. And it, it doesn't have to be necessarily regulated because the economic incentives are already there if there are recycling processes that are efficient enough to operate um, without having those external forces needed. If I just add your last question, maybe, about why we want to move to a closed-loop economy versus why we want to minimize transport, they, they really are related. I mean, right now what exists is mostly a lot of these materials being made in, in the Asian market and transported kind of one way to North America and Europe. But the whole point of a closed-loop economy is that these elements are never consumed. So if you really can establish each of those groups to make a closed-loop economy per region, then you never really have to be doing these transcontinental shipments anymore. If you go all the way from the recycling through the metal refining, through cell manufacturing to vehicle manufacturing and back around, each region can have that network, which really makes this much more localized. So that helps from the transportation side. It helps from the cost side, really not having to transport those long distances. And then also just from you know, the, the security of supply, knowing that once a material is in a region, it can be used indefinitely in that closed loop, really reduces those security risks, both for the the corporate level and the government level as far as national security. Yeah, I mean, it's when we talk to automotive OEMs, um, they're asking us for carbon footprints for every metal. Um, they understand that they will be taxed probably, we think, around 2027 on the carbon mm -hmm. uh, content. Um, I think the way we have figured it out, recycling probably reduces that carbon footprint 40 to 60 percent. Um, and so it will be as you say, it's a, it's a huge economic advantage rather than just being a good steward. It's also going to be the best way to do things. Um, yeah. Ryan, your path to market? So we're currently building our first you know, pre-commercial pilot facility. So it's a, a throughput of 20,000 metric tons per year. It includes both the front end of our process, that mechanical demanufacturing, and also the back end, our hydrometallurgy train, right in one facility. So we're building this in northern Nevada. We've received the majority of our permits to start construction. You know, we've hired our construction firm and finished the design of the full plant. And we'll be breaking ground any day now as we hear back on the last permit. Awesome. And like I mentioned, we also have our, our primary lithium extraction system. So we were fortunate enough to just win a Department of Energy grant a few months ago, you know, working with DuPont on this process. So we're building a, a five metric ton per day field demonstration system in central Nevada for our, our primary lithium extraction system that we're building in, in parallel with our recycling plant. And that is a DLE? It is not DLE. Uh, it is 
It's a selective leaching type process that we've established that really is, is moves that selectivity one step up in the process flow sheet, which then allows for a much more simplified leach liquor generated. And then a few different steps about how we actually make our lithium sulfate and convert it to a final hydroxide cathode gray product. Interesting. Um, there's a lot of companies looking at the recycling area, um, a lot. Um, what do you think the future will be in terms of this industry? Do you think it will be many, many smaller players, or do you think one technology sort of wins out and becomes the dominant area? Brian, you're, you're the big thinker here. Uh, do, you, do you think it will be many different processes for many different parts of the world? And, or how, how do you sort of see this industry 10 or 15 years from now? I don't think there will be a technology that's a winner because the chemistry of batteries is not fixed. There's not a winner on the battery side. It's dramatic amounts of R&D going into the battery manufacturing side. And as that keeps improving, the recycling industry has to keep improving with it. And that's why these have to be dynamic facilities. I mean, as far as who's actually going to be the winner, I think it really comes back to this closed loop economy and the fact that these elements are never consumed if they're handled correctly. So what I really see happening is these types of you know, partnerships or alliances or consortia between companies in each of those different groups of the circular economy. If you have a battery recycler and a primary metal extraction company with a cathode company and other metal refiners and a cell company and a vehicle company working together, you can essentially own that material indefinitely. You can own that supply chain. You can really work to be independent from the rest of the market. You can have almost indefinite security of supply by having access to those materials going forward. So I think it's those alliances being formed and whoever can form the best partnerships to really make that happen at the commercial scale. And then even beyond just the products in market, you have your R&D divisions between the recyclers, the cathode companies, the cell manufacturers, you know, working together on the next generation of material of what's up the pipeline. So you're not just waiting to see what happens to get to market. So I, I really see that as the key to going forward is locking down those relationships with, with the large players to form those consortia.